Okay. I guess we can start. Okay, so good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce you, Evangela Pitura, who is professor at the Computer Science and Engineering Department of University of Ioannina in Greece. So for those who don't know where is Ioannina, uh, um, Evie will explain us where it is uh, using, uh, during uh, her talk. And uh, there she leads the distributed management of Data Lab. Um, as uh, all of us, she first received a Bachelor of Science degree from the from the our University, University of Padua. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and then she spent some time at the University of Peru, uh, from which she received a Master of Science and a PhD degree. So our publication include more than 150 articles in international journal and conferences. And she, ser she has served and still serves uh, on several editorial boards and as a chair and co-chair of many international conferences. She actually was the PC chair of the ADBT conference in and Bordeaux this year. And I have the pleasure to work with you on that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, she, she is the recipient of three best paper awards, a Marie Curie Fellowship, and two recognition of service awards from SEM. So our research interests are in the general area of data management, of course, and with a recent focus on uh, social networks right. and uh, data exploration uh, based on provenance, diversity, and time. Right. And uh, during uh, her talk, she will um, um, explain how to explore the history of uh, large data graphs um, okay. and uh, taking example about on networks, social. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, bonjour. Um, Thank you, Christine, for the kind introduction. And I would like to thank also the organizer for the invitation. Um, I'm very happy and honored to talk to you today. So let me start by um, showing you where we are located. So Ioan and I is uh, there at the Red Bean. Uh, it's a beautiful city by the lake. And the last photo is the entrance to our university. Um, this is our lab. Uh, you may know uh, some of my colleagues. Uh, Panos Vasiliadis uh, is known for his work on OLAP, uh, Data Warehousing and DTL. Then uh, Panagiotis Tsaparas uh, joined uh, four years ago from Microsoft Research. Uh, he is more of a data mining guy, so he does uh, work on social media data m uh, mining and analysis. And then uh, the latest addition is Nikos Mamoulis. Uh, he joined our department two years ago from Hong Kong. Uh, he is known for his work on uh, spatial data management and analysis, and it's me. Uh, uh, I, I, my, I have worked uh, in many areas in data management. My recent interests are in two areas. One is data exploration and how you can use preferences and diversity to improve the quality of uh, the data you get. And we are currently looking on extending diversity and relating it to non-discrimination and fairness. And the other area I work on is not, uh, currently is graphs and evolving graphs. And this is the topic of the talk. So I will be talking about this today. So first of all, why graphs? Uh, why care about graphs? Um, graphs are a very natural model for, uh, for interactions and relationships between entities. So in social networks, uh, the nodes can be users and uh, links can be friendships or interactions or represent interaction between the users. Then, of course, in communication networks, we, you have um, persons that call each other or email each other. And then there is the internet, the web, um, biological networks where you have nodes that are proteins and then you model their interactions. And then also linked open data and RDF data are also forms of graph data, right? So there are a lot of uh, data graphs out there. And most of these graphs, represent uh, things that evolve over time. So um, people, uh, new nodes are added, new friendships are added, new interactions are added, um, people, uh, people interact with different people through time. So there is a lot of evolution being do do going on in such networks. Okay, and this evolution is, refers both to the structure of the network and to the content of the network. Most often there is content um, related to the, both the nodes 
for example, information about the profile of a user in a social network, and also there is content on the links. Okay, what kind of information people exchange with each other. So both this content and the structure of the network evolves over time. Okay, so uh, we model this uh, with a sequence of graph snapshots. One snapshot per time instant. So a graph snapshot represents the state of the graph at that time instant. Okay, so we uh, assume that uh, uh, time is discrete and we can uh, assume that time, this is real time, so we have one snapshot per second or one snapshot per month, or we may assume that an operational, take an operational uh, uh, approach and take snapshot every, every, let's say, 100 operations. Okay, so we have a sequence of graph snapshots, each one of them representing the state of the graph at this time instant. This is our model. So there have been a lot of recent work on graphs, uh, of how to process graphs, and this is a, a, very, a very rough taxonomy of this work. So you have uh, offline graph analytics, where you look to, at properties like the diameter of the graph, or uh, how, centrality, you do you, different definitions of centrality, for example, betweenness, page rank, and then you count tri triangles, you are trying to find clicks, uh, Course, you do clustered community detection, and there is also another line of work which we can call it online query processing, where you can, you can pose queries on the graph. The most common one, the common ones, are its ability queries, uh, where you are given two nodes and you are asked where they are connected. Uh, shortest path queries, what is the distance, the shortest path distance between two nodes? Uh, graph pattern matching. You're given a pattern and you are trying to find matches of this pattern in the large graph. And then you have uh, traversals, sparkle QL queries, and so on. Okay. Most of this previous work looks at a single snapshot of the graph. Right? So you have a single snapshot and you pose the squares in this single snapshot. Uh, what we do is we try to uh, find useful queries that we can apply to the whole sequence of graph snapshots. Okay, so this is a small taxonomy of the possible query ways to query uh, this, nap, this, this uh, sequence of graph snapshot. Uh, the first one, what we call historical graph queries, here you are, giving, um, you are given the sequence of the graph and the graph query, and you want to apply it in a set of time intervals. You want to find the results of these queries in all the time instances in these intervals. Okay. Uh, and then, for example, you want to find the shortest path distance between two nodes in an interval. And then there are different semantics associated with this. How do you ag aggregate the results? So uh, do you want the shortest distance at one instance, at all distance, at a, a large enough number of instances? Okay. So this is the first type of uh, queries on this kind of graphs. The other type of queries is what we call persistence or durability queries. So again, you have a query, uh, you, have, uh, you have a sequence of graph snapshots, you have an input a set of time instances, and you want to find the most durable results, the results that are true for the largest number of time instances. Okay. Uh, I'll show some examples of this kind of queries. For example, uh, what is the subgraph that matches an input pattern for the, largest, uh, for the largest period of time? And of course, there are variations. You can ask for the top K queries or for uh, queries that uh, uh, have for results that last for at least K uh, instances. And the last type is what uh, uh, we call evol evolution queries. For example, what is the first time that, ha that something happened? How many times you have a result? Uh, and then you can also query the, uh, the, the pattern, of, what is the pattern of evolution? How does the graph evolve? Okay. So this is quite a, a new area of, uh, of, of, of research. Um, there, there has been some work. Um, most, part of, most, most work is on how you efficiently store the snapshots. So you don't want to, uh, to store the whole sequence of snapshots. So you want to do it more efficiently. And there is work on that. Uh, and, and, uh, and then also how to reconstruct, uh, reconstruct all the snapshot. There has been so also some work on some uh, type of queries, uh, basically historical, what I called previously historical. So how do you do shortest path queries in sequences and how you do reachability queries. 
Um, and of course, uh, this is quite different what, from uh, work on dynamic graphs. Here you have uh, graphs that again evolve over time, but you just want to apply the query to one snapshot, the current one. It's also uh, different from work on streaming uh, graphs. Okay. Here you want to reevaluate your query when the graph uh, evolves over time. Okay. Here in, in our work, we have the whole history and we apply queries in the history, in this evolution, the, the evolution of the graph. Now, why care because, uh, about this kind of queries? Because for, 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 uh, the general goal is knowledge discovery. We want to understand how the network works, for example, in social network analysis and biology. It's also um, useful for predicting the, the future, for example, in applications like how to recommend links in marketing also. And also you want to, to do what it's called digital forensic, for example, virus propagation or disease propagation for journalism. So it's, it's, it's interesting to be able to query the history of an evolving graph. Okay. So after this uh, broad introduction, I will move on and uh, describe one particular type of uh, uh, queries that we have been working on is uh, durable, we, we call them durable graph, graph pattern queries. And then I briefly touch uh, two other type of queries. Uh, we call them best French forever, BFF, and uh, reachability queries. And then I will conclude the talk. Okay. So let's start with Europe graph pattern queries. Uh, okay, let me first introduce pattern queries, pattern matching queries. So uh, we have labeled graphs. In the figure, I use colors for labels. So in this example graph, you have three uh, labels, the orange, the green, and the reddish uh, label, right? So you are giving a graph, a labeled graph, and you're also giving a pattern. Uh, an example pattern is in the left of this figure. And you are trying to find matches of this pattern inside your graph. Okay. You do what is called uh, uh, isomorphic, isomorphous test. So you want to match one by one the nodes, and you want to also maintain the, the links. So let me show you. This is a match. Okay. So the, the two, the two uh, orange uh, nodes in the triangle are matched to node 1 and 9, and then uh, the green node is matched to node 7, and then the last uh, orange graph is matched to node 6. Okay. So this is one match, and here is another match. So this is uh, how we do uh, pattern matching. Okay. So this is a very well studied uh, problem, a very well studied query. Uh, the thing is that subgraph isomorphism is NP complete, so you don't have a good algorithm for that. And there has been a lot of papers discussing how you do it more efficiently. Um, you can use some form of graph indexing, so you speed up matching. And most approaches use a, a filter, a two-phase approach, a filter and verify. In the first, uh, in the first uh, phase, you just uh, uh, use in the index to generate some candidates, matches. And then at the second time, at the second phase, you try to verify them using some form of graph traversal. And there is another approach where you just uh, decompose, the decompose the query, you match part of, of it, and then you try to join these results. Okay, so we introduce what we call Europe graph pattern queries. So now you have a sequence of graph snapshot, you have a pattern, you have a set of time intervals, and you want to find the most durable matches. Those matches that are there for the longest period of time because there is information in this. This, this matches survive over time. So we are trying to find matches that are the most durable ones. And we have two logical interpretation of what duration of an interval means. Uh, one is a collective interpretation. So uh, imagine you are given uh, the, the example interval i with a set of intervals. So you just count the time of instances in this interval. And then this, this continuous interpretation, you are just looking for the longest uh, continuous interval. Okay. And then we have two variations, what we call collective time durable graph pattern queries and continuous time. Okay. And I have a simple example. Uh, here is a, a small pattern. Here is a match of this pattern, a collect, the collective duration of this match is three, continuous is one, and here is another match. Here collective is two and continuous is two. So if you want to find the most um, durable continuous 
uh, mats. This is uh, the one. If you want just to find the most collective, the most, the one that is collectively most durable, this is the mats, right? So this is the problem definition. And it's a useful problem, for example, in uh, co collaboration on networks where, uh, or, or in social networks, you want to find persistent patterns of collaboration, friendships, interactions in proteins, complex that are durable through, through, through time, in biological network, uh, change, durable chains of nucleids, uh, or in marketing, you want to find durable patterns of support about, among specific demographics. So there are uh, useful applications of this type of, of queries. Okay, so, um, okay, there's a very simple solution to this problem, right? You just apply graph pattern matching at its snapshot, and then you aggregate. Okay, so you find the matches at its one of the snapshots, and then you maintain, you, you, uh, you just find the one with the most uh, uh, matches. Actually, this is quite expensive, because you have to retrieve all matches at each uh, time instance, even, even this match does not appear in any subsequent instance. And when the, there are popul the, uh, there are pop the patterns are popular and there are hundreds of matches, of a million, or, or thousands of matches, uh, and long intervals, this is quite inefficient. So in our experiments, this, there query, this approach would take, take a lot of uh, uh, hours to, 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 to complete. So we have um, a, a different approach. We call it filtered and verify, and it's based on three, uh, three concepts. One is a version graph. Which, is a, um, which I will show, it's a, a, a natural um, compressed representation of the, of the sequence. Um, we use some uh, indexes that we call, we call them graph time indexes, and we somehow adjust uh, the, the threshold. So let me start by explaining the version graph. So you have the sequence of graph snaps up at the top, and we use uh, the graph on the left to represent them. Uh, this, the version graph is just the union graph, so you have all nodes, all edges, and its edge is annotated, and its node is annotated by its valid period. For example, edge 1, 2 has a label 1 and 3, uh, 5, which is uh, the intervals where this edge exists. Okay. We also do um, represent those, uh, those uh, labels using bits. Okay. So if you have a maximum of 16, uh, this is an example, if you have a maximum time instance, you put 1 um, if the uh, if the, the, the edge exists, zero otherwise. And this is very useful when you want to do traversals in this kind of graph. For example, if you want to traverse, starting to do a traversal starting from node one, um, for, then going to node two and then to node four, you want to join the intervals on the labels, right? So you want to know, to find out in which time instances one was connected to four through two. And by having the bits, this is very easily done by just taking uh, end. Okay. So we, we have used other uh, representations. We have a, a small benchmark comparing them. This was the most efficient way to, to do it. OK, so we have, uh, uh, this is, uh, we take a filter and verify approach. In the first phase, we uh, find candidates for its pattern uh, query, for its, uh, for its uh, node in the pattern. We find matches using our indexes. Then we use the index to refine the candidates, and then we use the version graph to, to, do, um, to perform joins and verify what, what, which of the matches are, 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 are correct. Okay, so let me uh, explain a little bit the indexes. We use uh, what we call time label or TILA index. Okay, it's a very, it's, a, it's an index that given a label and the time instant, uh, we, you have constant time retrieval of all nodes having label L at this time instance. And we have TIPLA index which does the same, but for paths. So given a label and given a path, sorry, given a path and time instant, you find all the paths that have, that all the nodes, um, all the starting nodes of this path at time. Okay, and uh, we also have um, information uh, indexes that keep information per node. For, so for each node, we keep a bit array uh, uh, indicating uh, whether the node has, lab has neighbors with that specific label. Okay, and we extend that with counters. So we maintain the number of neighbors with a specific label. Okay. Uh, 
So I, we have the version graph, we have the time indexes, and the last thing we do is we, uh, we try to, um, uh, to somehow um, predict the maximum duration of the path. Okay. So um, if you wonder, um, those uh, path index give uh, different selectivity, they have different selectivities. I, don't, I wouldn't go into details, but if you think about it, you can see examples where one index is preferable than the other. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the threshold. So in, in the first, uh, in, in the first, uh, in the simplest uh, application of, of our approach, we just try to find, we set the, the threshold to one, and we just try to find all matches with duration at least one. And as we find matches, with, we increase this threshold. Uh, this was this is some, somehow inefficient in the first run of the algorithm because you get too, ma too many matches. So the, 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 the idea was to try to use the index to predict uh, the maximum duration of, uh, of the match. Okay. So we use the index to predict uh, the longest possible duration of a pattern. And how we do it? Uh, we, um, we predict, we, we look at the indexes uh, for each, for each, for each um, node in the pattern. We, we look at the maximum time interval for which there are candidate matches, and we just take the minimum of them. Okay. So we now start by trying to find matches. We, are, we are start optimistically trying to, to find matches that have to duration at least uh, theta max. And then if we are unlucky, we decrease it. And how do we, we can we uh, decrease it? By binary search or by um, what we call min max, estimate the next possible maximum theta using the indexes as before. Okay. So this is. So this is uh, our algorithm, and we, of course, we have evaluated it. Um, we used uh, two data sets, YouTube and DBLP. Um, okay, uh, I won't uh, bother you with performance uh, results, so I'm just going to show you some representative examples of our results. Um, okay, so we have two different types of pattern queries. One is uh, clicks with the same label. Okay, so you have uh, fully connected subgraphs with the same label, and then we have random uh, queries. Now, uh, let me explain how we do the labeling for the DBLP graph. Uh, you all know about DBLP, right? So the DBLP uh, graph, nodes are authors, and there is a link between two authors if they wrote a paper together. Okay. And we take snapshot, snapshots. So we have the whole DBLP data set from 1959 till uh, 2014, this is uh, right, 60 or more years, okay? So we have one snapshot per year, okay? And we label the nodes by the number of papers they have in the specific year. So you are a beginner if you have less than two papers and so on. Okay. And we um, post quer queries like that. Okay, so this is the sizes. Let me say that we keep all our data structure in memory. This is the construction time. And uh, let me just uh, uh, say the conclusion. Um, uh, Citinla was uh, found to be a good compromise between the size and the response time. And then between min max was better than binary. And uh, the simple method that didn't consider the threshold uh, works only when candidate size is small. Okay. Now I want to, use, to show you some qualitative results of our research. So here are some actual clicks and you may recognize some of the authors. So those uh, uh, are uh, clicks of size two. Um, the, first, the first line is a click of size two, and those authors wrote papers to, they are both prolific authors, and they wrote together uh, articles in, in the intervals on the right. Okay. Now we, we thought of a different labeling, which I think is more interesting. So in this, uh, in this experiment, we label, we label nodes by the conference they publish, right? So if in 2004 you published in DBLP, in VLDB and in EDBT, you have labeled DBLP and EDBT. And we use uh, patterns, um, uh, clicks with the same label. So this is the sigmoid click of size two, a sigmoid uh, click of size three, and so on. Okay. And we did this for, um, for all the conferences. 
And here I report our results for, 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 from this experiment. So, uh, for example, uh, for Sigmund, which is the first line, we have uh, one match, a, a click of size two, with duration, uh, with uh, uh, collect the duration of uh, uh, 11 years. So these two people, these two people wrote papers in 11 uh, uh, Sigmund papers. And then we have, for example, the last, uh, the last line says that we have six authors uh, that, uh, we have uh, six authors that wrote uh, papers in Sigmund for three years, and we have uh, 1,000 such uh, six tuples. And we have the results for the other conference. Now, it's interesting to, to, to notice that uh, database conf in database, well, well it, uh, actually, let me explain. I have a color blocked uh, the type of conference. So the top ones are, let's say, database related. The next ones are um, data mining. Uh, the, the, the greens are, uh, are theory, and then you have systems and uh, com uh, communications and so on. So it seems that uh, database conference have the largest clicks. Okay. Sigmund has the most large ones, and then I VLDB, then ICD, and EDBD has the smallest clicks. And then um, um, uh, the, the data mining conference have smaller clicks. Uh, Sigir has the most, Sigir, Sigir which is the uh, Sigmund, the uh, the SIG conference uh, for the ACM conference for information retrieval has uh, Europe clicks, whereas uh, uh, K KDD, uh, K KDD has, uh, excuse me, uh, SIGIR has large clicks, where KDD has uh, Europe clicks. And then, as one expects, uh, in theory conference and in system conference, you find small clicks with smaller duration. And we repeat this for continuous, and then again, we have the results here. And let me. Uh, and then we, we also try to, uh, oh, okay, let me uh, show you the, the two authors with the 11, uh, uh, the 11 uh, Sigma papers, and then you get the authors with uh, the results for our conference. For example, for ICD, we have one match with uh, duration eight. Uh, you, you see some familiar names. And then uh, the same as for, for continuous. Um, here we have different people, but again, uh, you know most of them. And then we try to see uh, what is the cooperation between conferences. So we try to have clicks with different kinds of conferences. So this is the matches we found. As expected, uh, the, the orange ones, which are database-related conferences, there is some cooperation. But you find the zero uh, matches for uh, 3W and SOSP, or for OSD and SOSP. And you can take a look, take an idea about, uh, about how, what is the cooperation. And, if you wonder, here is the people that work together <laughs> in different areas. For example, uh, uh, Hellerstein and Senker have uh, uh, four, for, for have a match for four years uh, if, between Sigmund and Sigcom. Okay, so um, these are some examples of our work in this area. Let me now move on to some other type of queries. So uh, after uh, pattern queries, we thought what if you do not know the pattern, right? You do not know uh, how, 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 how the, the actual connection. So we, we thought of the following problem. Uh, given the history of Bratz, which is a set of nodes that remain the most densely connected through this history. And we call these nodes best friends forever nodes. So, this, so now you are given a sequence of graph snapshot, an aggregate density function that captures how densely connected are the nodes, and you want to find a subset of the nodes so that the density is maximized. In this case, we do not have labels. Okay. Uh, now, uh, there are many definitions of density. The most common ones is when you have a, a, a set of nodes, you get the uh, induced subgraph, and you get the minimum degree node in this uh, induced subgraph. This is one definition. The other one is just take the average degree. And then um, we consider these two different definitions of density, and then we do aggregation uh, accordingly. So we have mean, minimum over time using minimum degree, minimum over time using average degree, average over time using minimum, and average degree as well. You get, we get four different interpretations of density with different semantics. For example, minimum, minimum ensures that all, all friends 
are connected, um, sets a minimum on the number of, of the number of, 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 of the number of other friends of, let me put it this way. It uh, ensures that each person in the group has a, a minimum number of connections with other members of the group. Okay. So each type of density gets, gives us different semantics. Okay. And then we thought, and then we have a very, a, very, a very simple algorithm that does the following. You start with a whole set of nodes, and you select one, and you delete it, and you continue till you get one node. Okay. And then you just find the, the, among these nodes, this, this, this set of nodes, you select the one with the maximum density. This very simple algorithm, um, when you select to remove the node with a minimum degree, has been proven to be two times, to, uh, uh, to give a uh, two approximation for the static graph. And we have shown that this holds also for some of the metrics. For some others, you cannot use this. You, this, this does not give you a guarantee, but we have proposed efficient leading algorithms. Then we, we, we thought, uh, why asking uh, for the friends to be connected on the whole set of, uh, of, of interests. So we introduce what we call the on-off best from friends forever problem. Here you are given again a set of false snapshot, and you want to find the people that are the most connected in at least k of the snapshot. And we also output this k snapshot. Okay, so to summarize the on-off uh, best friends forever problem, best friends forever problem, you are given a sequence of graph snapshot, you are given an aggregate function uh, and an integer k, and you want to find the subset of nodes and that were the most densely connected in at least k of the snapshot, and we also output the k. Okay. This is an, we have shown that this is an incomplete problem, and we have proposed an iterative algorithm for that. And then we got uh, we've got one more type of query, what we call uh, uh, best friend with query node. So now you are also giving some query node, and you want to find the best friend of this node. Okay. And again, we use DPLP, and here are some examples. Um, on the top, you see the best friends. Uh, we use uh, uh, a subset of the DPLP with the 12 uh, well-known database conference, and you, you see what the best friends uh, in DPLP for the different interpretation of, of, of uh, aggregate function. For example, for minimum, minimum, uh, you get uh, these so three groups of people. Uh, on the bottom, we use when you use uh, aggregate, uh, uh, average aggregation, you get larger groups. And then um, I asked my students to try to find the best friends of uh, some people in the room. So the best friends of Christine Collet in, nine, two nine, in, is in this time interval, um, we find out that is uh, Genovena Vargas Solar and uh, Jose Luis uh, Zechinel Martin. Um, I don't know if uh, Christine agrees with this result. Uh, and uh, the, this is uh, Christine's best friend uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this period. Uh, and then we, we tried the same with Lajel and Farouk. Um, Lajel has much more varying results, so Lajel has a lot of different kind of friends. I have the complete uh, results for Lajel. Mukesh uh, uh, Mohania appears in many of these groups, and uh, we try the same with Farouk. Uh, Farouk is between uh, Christine, that has uh, stable and uh, stable corporations, and uh, Lajel, has, which is very diverse. Farouk is in the middle. I know if this is uh, close to real life, <laughs> but. <laughs> That's what uh, uh, our results show. And uh, Farouk, um, your best friend seems to be the, the, the one that's consistently appeared in most of the group is uh, 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 Benatala. Okay. And I have the complete results if you want to, to see them for all your friends. Uh, okay. So um, this is uh, okay. And then uh, we also try this uh, on a Twitter graph. Okay. So we try to, buy, to find best friends in the Twitter graph. Um, here, uh, the nodes are hashtags, okay, and uh, you have a, a link between two nodes, two hashtags, if they appear in the same tweet. Tweet, oh yeah, tweet. We use a data set that we have used in some previous work we have done uh, on Twitter. So uh, we take, we, it's tweets from 
basically news uh, sites, news agencies. And we, this was the results for a 15 days period in 2013. Uh, we try a different case. Uh, for, for very large case, we didn't find any matches, which uh, confirms the, the fact that uh, Twitter is very dynamic. So uh, news in Twitter die very, very, very fast. But for smaller type, type uh, values of K, we got uh, various, uh, um, uh, we get some more interesting re results. For example, uh, some of them uh, refer for, for, your, for those of you which, uh, I don't know, are fan of Formula N1, F1, cars. Uh, there are some, <laughs> uh, this captures some events uh, that happen uh, during this period. And then there's some, some tweets related to uh, WikiLeaks. So we were trying to find, we, we were able to locate some friends among, some friends about hashtags. Okay. So, uh, okay, so uh, my last example is an example, it's reachability queries. So, so far I have uh, shown you work about um, uh, what, we, I, uh, well, what I called in the beginning uh, du a durable or persistent <coughs> queries. Uh, this is an example, uh, it's, it's the first query that we looked in, actually. It's an example of historical query. So, and for, for a normal reachability query, you are given a direct graph, two nodes, you ask whether they're connected. There exists a path between them. Now, a historical reachability query, again, you're given the, the sequence of the graph snapshot, two nodes, and you ask whether there is a path in all the snapshot in, or in at least one of them. We call them the first one conjecti conjunctive historical reachability query, and the second one disjunctive historical reachability query. Some background on reachability queries. Um, if you think about it, um, there are two, two simple approaches. One is you pre-compute everything. Okay. For all pairs of nodes, you compute uh, their transitive closure. You know whether they're connected or not. Okay. The other extreme is you do it online. You do traversals. Okay. In between, you have different approaches where you maintain different types of indexes. And what you normally do is uh, starting from the uh, from the original graph, you find inside this graph uh, strongly connected components. Okay, so each node in the in strongly connected component is connected with every other node in the in the component, and then you uh, represent uh, this uh, this using a direct uh, cyclic graph, uh, uh, where each node represents a single con a strongly connected component, and an edge exists represents whether the strongly connected components are connected with each other. Okay, so we extend this work. Uh, we basically find connected component and its snapshot. Okay. Now, uh, the nice uh, part of this work is that we try to relate strongly connected component that we find at different snapshots. So we try to match snapshot, the connect component different snapshots. Okay. So we do it using a b b Bipartite mapping. We saw that this, this equivalence between the, the two problems, and we f once we found a strongly connected component at one snapshot and that is following one, we try to map and see which one of them are similar using bipartite matching. And then our approach used this idea: uh, a connectivity uh, maintains a connectivity uh, graph between the strongly connected component and uh, a two-hop index on the version graph between the strongly connected component. So, uh, if you, I, I do not have any DBLP results for this type of query, <laughs> uh, but uh, you can uh, look uh, at our papers for more information. Uh, the work uh, I presented about Best Friends Forever uh, is uh, uh, at the review. I don't have your, your, uh, <laughs> your, preference, uh, your friends in this paper, and some uh, papers on other things. Okay. So uh, work now in, in this area is very broad. So there is, you, you, are, you can think of very different type of queries that you, you can pose in this, uh, in this type of graphs. Okay. So besides queries, we have been working on two different lines of, 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 of research. One is uh, what uh, I call structural evolution. Here, we uh, consider graphs that only grow. Okay. So you do not have any deletions. 
and we have looked at three different problems in this, in this type of graphs. They are related to edge augmentation. So, uh, assume you are given two snapshots. We are looking for the pair of nodes that came closer together in the these two uh, snapshots. We call them top K converging pairs. Now, the opposite problem is, okay, you are given two snapshots. Uh, what are the edges that if you add them, uh, you bring most nodes more closely connected on, on this graph? And we call it the creating the shortcuts. And our most recent work is trying to um, connect them, uh, combine them with a link recommendation. For example, in a social network, Twitter or LinkedIn, you get the recommendation for possible uh, to connect with friends, right? So we thought of uh, proposing uh, friends, not possible potential friends, not only based on relevance, but also in terms of uh, distance. So we recommend people that are not only relevant to you, but if you connect with them, they bring you closer to the largest number of other people in the network. Okay. So we have tried to combine this with link recommendation. And there are also very, um, very uh, important uh, problems um, in, in, in what we call diffusion. Okay. So in this kind of, 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 of research, um, you run processes on the graph. For example, uh, imagine a virus that gets propagated in the network, or a rumor, or, or, or a new idea that's propagated on the network. So most previous w uh, research does consider, does consider one snapshot. What happens when there is evolution, when the underlying network changes as you propagate this idea? So this is a, 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 an area of research that's still really open. Okay, so, okay, I think I was, okay, okay, so let me uh, offer some very short uh, conclusions. So, uh, I have tried to convince you today that uh, graphs um, are, are a very natural model for many, for many uh, real data, data, right? So, there, it's a very natural way to, to explain, to, to model uh, entities, their relationships, their interactions. Okay. These graphs evolve over time, and there is rich, very rich information for querying their evolution. For example, Christine proposed doing prevalence. Okay, why do they evolve this way? Right? So there is a lot of inter interesting research to be done in this, in this area. Um, from our perspective, we are looking at different, different uh, ways to extend our work. One is uh, on heterogeneous graphs. So in heterogeneous graphs, you have different type of relationships between uh, nodes. Okay. So, and so uh, is there a way to try to query how this uh, different type of uh, edges co-evolve over time? Um, another uh, another uh, extension that we are thinking of is go beyond density and try to define other ways of connectedness. For example, uh, uh, think about uh, co co communities. Okay. Um, and the last thing is uh, um, perhaps there is some way to, 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 to study uh, evolu uh, evolution in RDF graphs. What about sequence of RDF graphs or sequence of ontologies that change over time? So in, 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 I, I, I believe that there is a lot of things that one can, can, can work on, on in this area. And I just want to, to mention my colleagues. Uh, the, the most, of, uh, most of this research is, done, is part of uh, uh, the PhD uh, of one of my PhD students, uh, Kostas Semergidis, and uh, uh, the BFF work, uh, and uh, some other of my students. Uh, for the BFF, uh, we have cooperated with Evi Maria Terzi and Panagiotis Aparas. Evi Maria is in Boston, uh, Panagiotis is a colleague in Ioannina. Uh, the other research and evolving graph is uh, joint work, work with Panagiotis Zaparas and a bunch of master students. They're all now uh, PhD students. Nikos is in Rome, Kostadina in Berlin, uh, Kostas is still in Ioannina, and Natalie is uh, here in France. So, uh, very diverse. <laughs> uh, so, uh, that's concludes my talk. Uh, thank you for listening, and thank you. I'd be happy to answer any questions or come. Yeah. Hear any yes, comments? Of course. Uh, I hope I, I didn't. I
I, I tend to, to talk too fast. Uh, <laughs> I apologize. A little bit, a little bit. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> don't, don't worry. We have plenty of time for questions right now. Or I for guess. coffee. Whatever. Or for coffee. Or for changing with you. <laughs> making new links. <laughs> make, uh, make, making new friends. <laughs> probably durable ones. Uh, Any question? Okay, so, um, so you make a clear difference between uh, evolving graphs and uh, dynamic graphs. Mm -hmm. So uh, in your work, uh, is it uh, easy to, uh, to, ex to, to, to extend yes, uh, your algorithms in, uh, for dynamic graphs? Um, we, can, we can add the, okay, we can add new snapshots in very easily in, in the history. So it's very, uh, f we can do f a fast update of our indexes, but our focus is um, having the whole history. So uh, working dynamic graphs that just look at the current snapshot, right? Yes. So we want to use the, the whole information. Uh, we can, it's very easy to, new, to add new snapshots as the graph evolves. So in that sense, uh, we can do it dynamically in the sense that we add new snapshots very fast. Yes, but, okay. uh, but the focus is different. Yes, in, but you use uh, a lot of memory for yeah, evolving that, graphs. That. So, uh, uh, yes, yes. That's why we try to find uh, uh, data structures that uh, that are uh, uh, that do some kind of compression. So the version graph just try to compress them. So the version graph for most of the graphs we can maintain it, maintain it in memory. And of course, there is a lot of work to be done for doing that in parallel, right? Mm. So, or doing um, disk-based uh, uh, data structures. So there is a, lot, a, whole, uh, a, a whole new areas of doing research in this aspect. Okay. Yeah. I guess it's a strong uh, hypothesis saying that structure all yeah. sustainable. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. It's more uh, about your opinion. So right now there are really two ways to deal with uh, very large graphs, graph databases like Neo4j or, or so on, and, um, and graph uh, uh, data processing frameworks like Pregle and, mm -hmm. and Giraffe, where you can store the graph um, mm -hmm. in different ways like relational databases. So what's your feeling about what, what's the best approach? Uh, yeah. Or what are, in more detail, yeah. what are the criteria to yeah, choose yeah. between the two? Yeah, yeah, right. Um, I think that, um, uh, I, I, saw, I saw the taxonomy about the different types of processing. So I think for queries, when you have a query, uh, of course, data data databases or graph basis, graph databases are more appropriate. But when you do want to do large scale analytics, then uh, graph databases, I'm not sure that they scale well. So I, depending on the queries, you have different uh, different infrastructures. Uh, so. This is a very short uh, answer, but uh, I think this is a, a dividing point between which one of to use. <laughs> but uh, still, there is, there, is, uh, there is not much understanding of what, what is the best way to do it. So still a lot of work to be done in this aspect as well. Because you try to cover too many different types of processing. So what kind of information do you want to get, to get out of a graph? So we, we, I think we are um, in the early stages. We are uh, before, for example, uh, if, we, if we think of relational databases, we are before the relational model. So, a lot of work to be done also. Thank you, Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question on your examples. When you, in a real scenario, you often need queries where we have to adapt the queries, the parameters, interactivity to have more interactivity in, in analyzing things and to visualize. So how do you think your, your structures, your index structures could adapt, or algorithms could adapt to be more incremental, okay. interactive uh, uh, okay. processing? Yeah. Uh, actually, um, the only way to, to do this is by changing parameters. So you run BFF with this kind of uh, uh, subset, with these types of parameters, you observe the results, you adjust but we don't have a systematic way to do it. So again, explore, exploring large graphs, it's very interesting. There is no 
way to do it efficiently now, no, no work on this, it's a very interesting topic. Um, our approach is you can just adjust the parameters. So, for example, you try best for French forever for a K, you see that there are matches, you decrease K and you try to find matches in the shortest period of time, but uh, you do it by is adjusting it, parameters. But is, yeah, you can adjust, but can you be incremental in adjusting? You don't have to recompute everything. Uh, we haven't done, we, we do not have a look into this. Okay. Okay, okay. so one more problem for. <laughs> Question? Is it possible to integrate some constraint or preference on the pattern graph that you, you, you will uh, to discover? Most probably, preference fit everywhere. So of course you can uh, you can uh, you do you can do preferences. For example, you can uh, express preference as patterns as well. So you can uh, um, uh, rank preferral patterns uh, ahead of other patterns. Yes, uh, you can uh, you can add preferences. I think you can add preferences. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Uh, one question um, uh, that has to do with um, your opinion on whether what you described uh, can be applied to uh, what we call property graphs or uh, multi graphs in general, uh, where we have uh, not uh, one type of labels, but uh, more. You hinted it a little bit uh, in um, uh, the with the multiple conferences also and so on, mm -hmm. but uh, any ideas around that? Um, actually, uh, what we have now um, works uh, when you have multiple labels on the nodes. Okay. Um, we have not worked yet when what happens when you have multiple labels on the edges. Okay. And a very interesting thing that we haven't looked at into, but I think it's very interesting is to try to to study the evolution of between the two. So uh, does this kind of label evolve faster than the other? Uh, is there a dependency between the evolution of one uh, label and the other? Uh, and then there is a, a lot of things that can be done. So yeah, we are just uh, in the beginning of looking at this problem. Actually. So no, no more questions? So if you have, uh, if you, to, to the PhD <laughs> student here, if you still uh, do not know what to do to your, in your thesis, you can, you can speak with <laughs> Amy, she has a lot of problems. Okay. Uh, one more question maybe. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I just found the talk very interesting and a bit terrifying, but um, <laughs> I would like to know. Uh, terrifying in good sense. <laughs> the, 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 the best friend can, <laughs> can extract. Uh, in terms so of privacy or, uh, or in terms also, of... Also, yeah. <laughs> so typically I would like to know if, uh, I mean, this study came from um, some demand from industry or from applications, or if, at the contrary, you, you, you found these queries, interesting queries, and you expect that, for example, Facebook will, will use it uh, or something uh, like that. Um, unfortunately, the second. So, <laughs> uh, we, we, we are very enthusiastic of this kind of queries and uh, we, we, we think that there are many applications. Uh, I think there's a very natural way to try to find information about that. There was also a story how uh, people uh, use uh, Neo4j to, to, to do the Panama, the Panama Papers. So, th I think th there is a lot of information, not just in history, but also uh, in dependencies between things. And graphs are a very natural uh, model of these dependencies. So, I think um, they are very, very interesting. Okay. So, that was the last question. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, you, you get the present from here. Oh, thank yes. you.